welcome to Autocracy Now. This episode, we're starting a new series. It's going to be about Huey P. Long. Episode 1, The Whirlwind. Imagine for a moment that there was a politician in the United States, very unlike the others. One who was willing to promise all things to all people, who had no qualms about changing his position on an almost daily basis. One who viciously attacked the establishment. One who viciously attacked the establishment, made personal attacks on his opponents, and gave them derogatory nicknames, violating nearly every democratic norm in the book. One who fought against freedom of the press, and constantly denounced the lying newspapers when they reported on the corruption that he was steeped in. A politician who was perfectly happy to tear up the constitution, and anyone who stood in his way, in order to achieve his ends. A demagogue whose rise and rise to power seemed absurd to the establishment, but made sense to the people, many of whom loved him and believed that he was the only one on their side. And, on this wave of popular support and promises, and with complete disregard for the way people thought things should be done, a politician who set himself up as a ruthless, corrupt, kleptocratic dictator. Now imagine that there was a politician in the US who fought against vested interests, big corporations, and argued tirelessly and energetically for the redistribution of the wealth. A politician who was never afraid to speak his mind and to speak truth to power, who had contempt for Washington because it was contemptible. A man of the people who was frustrated with being blocked and slandered at every turn, and the ineffective methods of his fellows at dealing with crisis. A man who subverted a corrupt and contemptible democracy on behalf of the ordinary people. A man who tried to destroy a system that needed destroying, and sought power in order to do the good that he knew other politicians couldn't do. A man with a sense of destiny, who was unfairly slandered and maligned by the vested interests and the wealthy elite that he sought to undermine. A man who built himself up from nothing, and became the hero of the common man. He would argue that he was only doing openly what everyone else had done covertly for years. A man who said, A demagogue is someone who doesn't keep his promises to the people, and I kept every one of mine. And many went along with him, and refused to believe any of the attempts to smear him, because they knew he was on their side. Both men existed in the manic, whirlwind frame of Huey P. Long who cut such a dramatic figure in Louisiana politics, and later national politics, in the 1920s and 30s. The man and the methods make him an irresistible figure for politicised histories. There are always two Hueys, the straight-talking man of the people who sought power to make things better, and the vicious demagogue who exploited lies and popular support to dominate the stage and enrich himself. Now, more than ever, when there seem to be two of every major political figure floating around, depending on your stripes, we should examine such a life. It helps that it's also an incredible story, and Huey himself is as quotable a politician as has ever lived. Huey P. Long was born on August 30th, 1893, in Wynn Parish, Louisiana. Huey himself would have you believe that his family were dirt poor and never had two sticks to rub together. He loved to use his humble origins as a political weapon against his enemies. But they were actually fairly well off compared to some in Wynn County. His father at least owned the farm that he worked on. He was never a wealthy man, but they had a house with two floors and electric lights, which put them above a lot of people in the county. The fact remains, though, that Wynn County was one of the most impoverished regions in one of the most impoverished states in the country. The soil was poor, the farmers struggled, and many of them resented the rich elites of the state, who constantly looked down on them with disdain. Wynn County also had a history of stubborn political radicalism, The Socialist Party candidate for president polled a lot of votes there, and Huey's own father had voted for him. During the Civil War, in the deep south state of Louisiana, Wynn County alone had supported the Union. In some ways, they were traditionally contrarians. Wynn folks distrusted the elites in large cities of Louisiana like New Orleans or the state capital of Baton Rouge. Maybe they were desperate enough to be anti-establishment by default, or maybe they knew that no one up there would listen to them anyway. For most people from Wynn, life was a question of survival, not one of ambition. Even in 1930, a fifth of white men in the state couldn't read or write, and amongst black men the statistics were far worse, although less well known. Social mobility was virtually non-existent. You died in the class you were born, and that was the way things went. Huey's remarkable political rise put him in sharp contrast with the US politicians who came from wealth, or else political dynasties like the Roosevelts and the Kennedys. His birth did not necessarily mark him out for great things. But he did have some advantages. His family were not so stricken by poverty that he couldn't go to school. 
and his mother was keen that all the children should have a good education. They had a rule in their household that any kid who was reading a book wouldn't have to do any chores. God, I wish we had that rule in my house, I never would have done anything at all. And Huey took advantage, and quickly read widely and deeply. Meanwhile, in the rest of the state, books were a rarity, and the town of Wynne had no public library. Most people, if they owned anything, owned the Bible, and that was it. It's really tempting to read a lot into the childhood reading habits of figures like Huey, to get insights into early influences on their psychology, because after all it does shape you. You know, if I hadn't read so many dystopian sci-fi books while I was growing up, I'd probably be happily frolicking in the field somewhere, rather than recording a podcast about dictators. Did exposure to Shakespeare give Huey a taste of drama? Did the Count of Monte Cristo teach him about the value of crushing his enemies? Huey himself would describe Wynne as his greatest influence. One of the great things about Huey Long is that we have autobiographies that he wrote in his own words. So his autobiography is very self-serving and quite unreliable, but I'm going to quote from it a lot because it's a good source. He wrote, quote, My sympathies were with those whose fight for subsistence was living from hand to mouth, of which there seemed to be more than a few among the people I knew. Our community was a kindly one. No one went hungry or in need of clothes if anyone in the neighbourhood had anything to spare. End quote. Huey's willingness to manipulate his own past for political ends means that we have to take everything he says with a grain of salt. He was a master of self-image, but more than just creating one Huey P. Long story that people might believe in or respect, he was brilliant at tailoring how he behaved to the situation and to the people he was with. There's a classic anecdote illustrating this that all the books quote. The first time Huey campaigned in the south of Louisiana, his local boss warned him that there were a lot of Catholic voters, and that Huey, who was from the Protestant north of the state, should take care to appeal to the Catholics. Huey started beginning all his speeches with some homespun charm. Quote, when I was a boy, I got up at six o'clock in the morning on Sunday, I hitched the up the old horse to the buggy, and I took my Catholic grandparents to Mass. Then I brought them home, and later that day, I'd hitch the old horse up again and take my Baptist grandparents to church. The leader was thrilled with the positive effect this had on the audiences. Here was a man who could unite communities in the state. He said, Huey, I didn't know you had any Catholic grandparents. Don't be a damned fool, Huey replied. We didn't even have a horse. Huey paid fast and loose with the truth consistently, but people loved him for it. As well as romanticising Wynn County as a place where people would share their wealth, including the Long family. Huey described several instances of injustice that he saw as a child, including a farmer being forced off his land by an unfair auction. The political language of Louisiana at the time is filled with so much apocrypha and so many colourful wives' tales and parables, it's hard to take any specific story seriously. But it's not so hard to believe that the inequality and desperate poverty that Huey saw growing up, as much as anything else, is what drove him into politics, even if it was just a means of personal escape from that poverty. The thing is, there are lots of people who claim to be representing the little man, and yet have never had experience of that. But Huey, more than most politicians, could claim that he did indeed know what it was like to be poor. As well as having a fierce intellectual streak, the young Huey was a whirlwind from the start. He was brash and filled up every room he was in. Everyone in town knew him. He was perfectly happy challenging authority. Bored with the seventh grade, he promoted himself to the eighth. Maybe as you'd expect from someone with so many siblings, he loved being the centre of attention. Either you let him pitch, or he didn't play, a school friend commented. He smoked and chewed tobacco, which he managed to keep a secret from his parents, and was even involved in a bare-knuckle boxing contest over a young girl's affections when he was 15. In the end, the girl ditched both him and his rival, so they'd fought for nothing, but good for her. But unlike his brother Earl, he didn't revel in violence. He'd say... Why should anyone be fool enough to fight when he can get what he wants without doing it? Huey fought with words. Once he burst in on a school debate and delivered an impassioned speech. Even at this early age, the trademark Huey Long delivery was being developed. Arms flailing, wildly denouncing people and things he saw as unfair, with all that hint of homespun charm. He wasn't even supposed to be there, and he walked away with a debate prize. That's Huey Long. Yet, despite being razor smart, and something of a smart aleck, he didn't finish high school. Accounts differ as to why, but it seems like Huey had a falling out with the principal. Either the principal insisted that everyone take an extra year of high school to graduate, which Huey objected to, or something more sinister and political was going on. 
The version that Huey tells is this. In the school, he'd established a secret society. We laid out the rules for the kids to follow, and if they went with the teachers instead of us, we'd keep them off the baseball team, the debating team. I was one of the ones that the teachers had it in for. I published a newspaper that attacked them, so they had me expelled. This story so perfectly mimics Huey's later political career that I really want it to be true. The idea that in high school, he was already developing his own political machine is a perfect historical illustration. After all, making a network that controlled prize positions on sports and debating teams, and using them as leverage over people to control them and defy authority, while also publishing newspapers that slandered his foes. This is Huey's whole career in microcosm. Did he really develop it at school, or is this all part of the long legend? It's hard to say. Certainly, he was ambitious and bold enough to do something like this, and he circulated a petition in the town to get the principal fired. It's on record that the principal left the school later that year. Whether he was ousted by Huey's schoolyard mafia and scandal rags, we'll probably never know. Even if this particular story is exaggerated, it's clear that the high schools had no idea what to do with Huey. He was miles ahead of his classmates, many of whom were struggling to learn how to read or write. It doesn't stretch the imagination too much that he got bored, like a lot of smart kids do, and held the authorities in contempt. He wouldn't be the first bright young kid to decide that he was smarter than his teachers, as well as all the other kids. Chances are, though, by the time he was 15, Huey already knew how he wanted his life to pan out. He had no desire to work on his father's farm, preferring to read than to plough a furrow. Although, of course, that's not how Huey tells it. In his autobiography, he describes toiling from dawn until dusk and saying, My sympathy goes out to all those who toil. Maybe it did, but he hardly worked as a farmhand for long. He'd learned to type, which was unusual in Wynn, and had worked at newspapers as a teenager, typesetting stories for them. But he didn't want to be a journalist or an academic either. Whether or not he constructed a political machine in his high school while he was still in short trousers, the young Huey loved politics. But politics in Louisiana was no place for starry-eyed idealists. It was a game you played. Most of the practices today we'd think are hopelessly corrupt. You built a network of supporters, associates, and voters with patronage. Offering people cushy government jobs was the way you got them on side and controlled their votes, and so you got elected to office. Louisiana was a one-party state. Only the Democratic Party ever got voted into anything. So the primary elections, where the Democrats nominated their candidate for a political office, were the only ones that really mattered in the state. To win these, you'd probably need the support of one of the political machines that was being operated in the state. These organisations, although shady, were well known to everyone. There were the old regulars and the new regulars in New Orleans. These political machines ran things in a way that was often corrupt and incompetent, but they knew their status. They were the power brokers that controlled the fate of the state. The old regulars, sometimes called the Choctaws, between them they controlled 35,000 votes in the city. But they didn't just rely on this to swing elections. They had control over the voter registrars. It was perfectly common for dead people, imaginary people, and even famous figures like Charlie Chaplin to vote in Louisiana elections and they always seemed to prefer the old regulars' favourite candidates. It worked, too. Between 1920 and 24, every governor of Louisiana was backed by the old regulars. These groups maintained power by controlling vice. They'd raid gamblers and prostitution houses while tacitly allowing some of them to go ahead. So many gambling houses and brothels were like sponges, wrung out to dry once they'd soaked up all of the illicit trade and money in the region. Outside of New Orleans, there were local political bosses and wealthy plantation owners who controlled their own blocks of votes and would happily give them to you for a price. In some ways, it was like the Roman Republican system, where wealthy men controlled the way their clients voted in exchange for money and favours. The one thing that all of these groups had in common was a sense of internal loyalty and justice. Honour amongst thieves, you might call it. You richly rewarded your friends and supporters, and you neglected and spurned your political enemies. Louisiana politics had plenty of demagogues. These were cut-price Huey Longs, but they usually rabble-roused the crowds by bringing up glorious episodes in Confederate history. The people of the state were not over the Civil War, and race-baiting in a state where black people were horribly disenfranchised was also a common political tactic. Nor were the politicians of Louisiana afraid to attack each other with flowery and colourful language. When one of his opponents called Huey, quote, 
a coward with the conduct of an egg-sucking yellow dog, and a man who lies with a craven heart like a white-livered popinjay. The polysyllabic spree was very familiar to the people listening. Huey, of course, gave as good as he got and more, but that's for later. Huey's first exposure to politics was supporting his brother Julius's favourite candidate in a local election in Louisiana. I didn't even know what politics was, but as soon as I saw it, I was in it, Huey later said. He was put in charge of the votes for a local parish, and Julius's candidate won by a healthy margin. Later, Huey, still in school, was put up as a candidate to debate the Socialist Party opposition. Huey attacked both the hypocrisy of big business and the failures of socialism, managing to walk a fine line, still being popular and on the side of the little man, but anti-socialist, in win, which had proved itself to be sympathetic to socialism before, like I said. He won the debate, passionately arguing on behalf of the small business capitalism that the farmers in Louisiana represented. A biographer describes the episode. Huey Long believed in the things he said. He would always believe in them, and he never ceased his efforts to lift the small and poor to a better life. Despite debating socialist politicians in public at the age of just 15, Huey couldn't run for office straight away. He took several jobs after leaving high school as a travelling salesman, and he found it well suited to his ability to persuade people and get them on side, with his oratory, rhetoric and homespun charm. In his autobiography, he said that he found the work all too easy. There's a great story of Huey selling an old man a second-hand coffin, quoting Bible scripture, showering the guy in a huge list of arguments. Only after the man became insistent that he must have his coffin right away did Huey have to reveal that he didn't actually have one. His first day on his first salesman job, he sold twice as many products as the experienced old tans on the team, whirlwinding his way into the hearts and minds of local residents and flogging whatever the company had for him to sell. Huey was a memorable figure, and you suspect that a lot of the people he charmed in his salesman days might have remembered and voted for him later on in life, their own little piece of political history. But he was also very astute at reading people, and understanding which lines of argument will persuade them best. Was the customer concerned with economy, or the quality of the product, or something with new features? Sometimes he'd even cook dinner for the families with the cooking oil he was selling, to demonstrate its superiority. Imagining this kid, straight out of high school, leaving the housewives of Louisiana dazed and handing over their money, wearing his overly big suit and tie, after a whirlwind assault of words and charm. The actual product was not important. Huey didn't care about the product. It was all about the salesmanship, he felt. He prided himself on his powers of persuasion. At one point, he even sold what's called snake oil medicines, you know, medicines that didn't work, including several that were denounced as actively harmful. There was one, wine of cardwee, that was supposed to alleviate cramps. It might have distracted you from the cramps, given that its main ingredient was raw alcohol. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Huey sold it by the bucket load, and I'm sure a lot of people would politically argue that selling snake oil and fake medicine is a good microcosm of how his career would go later on. He relates a wonderful, although probably exaggerated, story of the poverty of his early years in his autobiography. He got a new job in a town, Norman, near the university so that he could study and work at the same time. Huey? Quote, I gladly took the job, but how was I to get to Norman? Snow and sleet covered the ground, the wind was cold and cutting. I surveyed my belongings. I had exactly three nickels. I pondered whether I should ride the first nine miles for 15 cents, or walk all 18 and have the money. I took the course of walking the entire distance. According to Huey, he walked all night, only to find that he still needed 25 cents to make a telephone call to his new boss. He pawned his wallet, which was empty anyway, but it still wasn't enough to get by. His last hope was to charm a bank manager into giving him a loan. It was denied. Huey said, at least the banker wasn't crazy. But on his way out, he made a new friend and benefactor. He said to the man, The chances are whatever you hand me will be a gift, but if I can make it here, I can do it on five dollars. The man gave him the money, and Huey was saved from utter destitution. In Huey's version, he starts out depending entirely on the kindness and generosity of strangers to get by and get into law school. In reality, he probably borrowed some money from the members of his family too. He says that the incident made him determined to give what little he had to the less fortunate, wherever he could. The reality of his life does not always follow this path. Huey spent the next couple of years alternating between occasional studies in law at universities and law schools, his salesman jobs, 
and occasionally smoking, drinking and gambling with his local friends. At one point, he lost all of the money he had on a single spin of the roulette wheel. His older brother, Julius, had paid for his tuition in part by being good with cards, but Huey, games of chance didn't work out so well for him. Huey never took to the courses seriously, and he left with no college qualifications and mediocre grades, but he had all the books he needed, and learned voraciously the aspects of the law that were most interesting to him. Huey would read until midnight every night, drink half a gallon of beer, and go to sleep. His academic grades were no indication of a lack of effort. T. Harry Williams says in his excellent biography that they were pretty good for someone who studied law in spare moments between the twin careers in selling and gambling. Huey's whirlwind carried him into the law with the same irrepressible energy he brought to every endeavour, whether it was dominating the schoolyard or being a sweet-talking salesman. It was around this time, 1912-1913, that Huey met Rose McConnell, who he described as the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. She had a personality almost opposite to Huey's in many respects. She was shy, generous, caring, not especially manic, but he eventually managed to persuade her to marry him over the course of the next two years, after several failed proposals. One of a hundred dramatic incidences involves Rose being Huey's alibi. The night they went to the opera, he was wrongly accused of shooting at a man in the street. Rose often doubted that he was making enough money to support them both, and her family disapproved of him. This meant that their courtship was tempestuous, although Huey glosses over that. At one point, Huey even asked for his engagement ring back. But now that he had the beginnings of a family to support, Huey needed to move on from the life of a travelling salesman, and ramped up his law school studies. Huey claimed to study 16 or 20 hours a day, and hounded his professors and teachers for all the information they could provide. With no hope of sticking around long enough to get a law degree, his only chance was to cram, 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 and pass the Louisiana oral bar exam. Again, to hear Huey tell it, he dramatically runs out of money just a month before the exam dates, and has to apply for a special dispensation from the local judge to let him take the exam early. Of course, he passes with flying colours, and at the age of 21, the newly married Huey is a qualified lawyer in Louisiana. Not that he wanted to stay, even in the law. It was just a springboard for a political career, and Rose knew this. Huey said of himself, I was born into politics, a wedded man with a storm for a bride. Soon after they married, he told her his life plan. Maybe he'd worked it out when he was walking, penniless, at night, by the railroad tracks. Or maybe he'd had it since that first taste of politics when he was 15 years old, or even earlier. But he told his new wife, quite seriously, with a straight face, that he planned to win some minor local office, then become governor, then US senator for Louisiana, and from there, finally, become the President of the United States. This was Huey's ultimate goal. He didn't aim low. Anything else, dabbling in the law, travelling sales, these were just ways to make money to reach that ultimate goal. It almost gave you cold chills to hear him tell about it, Rose later said. He was measuring it all. Despite his plans, Huey's career in the law hardly got off to a flying start. He fell out with his older brother and mentor Julius, and he was struggling to make ends meet in a tiny backroom office. He was forced to seek out employment as a salesman again. Whatever few clients they got, Huey dealt with on the road while selling products. Eventually, though, things began to pick up. The first case he got of any note was an ideal case for the aspiring politician. A widow had left her entire life savings in the bank of Winfield. A member of the bank had taken the money for his own use, and, leaving a note with a promise to pay, had fled the state. The widow wanted to sue the bank and get her life savings back. Huey eagerly took on the case, but the bank insisted that the people who were suing would have to pay for the legal costs of the case until they won. Huey needed $100 for that that he didn't have. He had to appeal to the state senator for a loan and whipped up public sentiment against the bank for their unfair rules that would have denied the widow her day in court. Huey won the case, which was ideal for him, and started to make his name as the defender of the little guy against greedy big business. He fought countless cases like this, in which he details in his autobiography. He always preferred to be on the side of the humble, wronged client against the big corporate interest. Huey loved appealing to the people, championing his pet causes, and outmanoeuvring the slick city lawyers. 
Now, it's perfectly possible at this point that he could have pursued a lucrative law career, either continuing to fight cases like this, or working for one of the big corporations, selling out. They were forced to recognise his talent eventually. It's clear that he had the skill and energy to become one of the finest lawyers of his generation. He could have earned more money working for the corporations, but Huey knew that the cases he were fighting were of more than pure financial value. Every one of them made his local legend grow, and became a political anecdote that he could use in the future. His autobiography is littered with examples of helping the little guy. And Huey knew that he needed to fulfil one step of his master plan, and run for public office. Or, alternatively, if you're a Huey Long supporter, he knew that he was doing the right thing. He chose a field that wasn't particularly sexy or necessarily that interesting. He might have expected brash young Huey to run for mayor, or something along those lines, that would give him a taste of authority. But instead, he went for a position on the Railroad Commission, getting elected in 1918. Huey's first political campaign already had the hallmarks of later ones. He tirelessly went from small town to small town, speaking on platforms in the squares and making long lists of the people he'd spoken to and met, so that he could write to them personally to ask for their votes. He bypassed the bigger towns. There, the incumbent that he was running against was well-connected politically, so Huey stuck to the rural heartlands. He liked going to places where no other political candidate had ever been, where his speeches would draw big crowds from the sheer novelty of meeting a politician. Through sheer force of will, and with support from a growing circle of political allies, Huey won easily. So the position of railroad commissioner was pretty administrative, but there was a degree of calculation. Other men had used this office as a stepping stone towards becoming governor. Huey himself said he liked the fact that there was no minimum age. He was just 24. In this, he reveals a degree of shrewdness, because the commission had quite wide regulatory powers that he could use to attack corporate interests. Huey brought a level of whirlwind activity to the railroad commission that it wasn't used to. These positions were just like the ones that were typically doled out by the political machines like the old regulars to reward their supporters. The other men on the commission were middle-aged career politicians who had been there for decades. If they had agendas, aside from just continually drawing their salary, they were slow to pursue them. Specifically, the position allowed him to kick off a vendetta against the big oil company that dominated Louisiana, Standard Oil. When Huey denounced the legislature in the state as being bought and sold by Standard Oil, he had a point. A lot of them were in the company's pocket. His battle with the crack team of Standard Oil lawyers trying to bring the company under new regulations in Louisiana would carry on for four years. At the same time, he was starting to lay out his political platform. In 1918, he had a letter published in the newspapers. Quote, a conservative estimate is that 65-70% to 70 of the wealth of the nation is owned by 2% of the population. 68% of the people own just 2% of the wealth. From 1890 to 1910, the wealth of the nation trebled, but the masses owned less in 1910 than they did in 1890. 80 out of 100 never enter high school and only 14 in a 1,000 get a college education. What do you think of such a game of life, so brutally and cruelly unfair, with the dice so loaded that a child of today has only 14 chances of a 1,000 in securing the first part of the game? This is the kind of rhetoric you'll still hear today. It's still true today, it's still persuasive today, and it can still fill you with rage to think about it today. Huey may have been willing to manipulate people to fulfil his own ambition, but it can't be denied there was a cause worth fighting. The question is whether he was fighting the cause or exploiting it. In 1920, Huey won a big case against a bank. His fee may have been as much as $80,000, which was huge at the time. His money worries were over. From that point on, his career in the law was secondary to his political career, and he continued to rail against Standard Oil in flamboyant public speeches. He denounced them as an octopus containing some of the most notorious and corrupt criminals in these United States. He'd even criticised the governor directly. Arms flailing, face red, Huey livened up every political meeting he spoke at, and people were starting to listen. Everyone who met him realised that they were dealing with a uniquely talented and charismatic individual, even if they vehemently hated the things he said. In many ways, Huey relished being disliked and being the outsider. In 1920, he supported John Parker for governor, but soon he broke with Parker, 
Parker had some pro-reform tendencies. At least he realised that something desperately needed to be done to alleviate poverty in Louisiana. But he had two major flaws. The first was that, without his own political machine, he was vulnerable to the whims of the old regulars in New Orleans, who constantly worked against him. The second was that Parker was an aristocrat, and would risk upsetting his associates and friends with any platform that was too radical. When Huey decided to turn on Parker, he denounced him in a stinging set of circular letters. Huey said that Parker was a slave to the invisible empire of Standard Oil and the big corporations, including the Cumberland Telephone Company. He said that these corporations completely controlled the state and bribed legislators. Huey attacked the other two men who shared his public office in the Railroads Commission, and ended up being sued for libel. Parker, outraged that his former supporter had turned on him, said confidently, If what Huey says is true, I should not be governor, but if it's false, he should go to prison. Huey technically lost the libel case that followed, but he ended up having to pay a fee of just one dollar. The governor's case wasn't strong enough for them to risk a proper punishment, which might end up being overturned. And of course, in classic, dramatic, Huey Long fashion, he flamboyantly walked out of the courthouse after loudly refusing to pay the dollar. Huey was gaining in notoriety as a man who could get things done, and having already offended the big corporations and conservatives in Louisiana, he became the go-to guy for the people who had grievances with corporations. The newspapers regularly reported the exploits of this local hero, winning victories for the people. Many of the articles were written and submitted by Huey himself, along with gifts. His biggest case against the Cumberland Telephone Company ended up winning refunds for 80,000 people, and you can bet a good chunk of those people would remember who'd been responsible. It was a perfect case for Huey. If not, he would always be there to remind them, in speeches, letters and articles. My point in dwelling on all this is that Huey was a populist, but his promises weren't always as empty as his opponents claimed. There are countless incidents where he genuinely did help people, and bypassed the corruption or inertia of the bureaucracy to do so. His manic energy that went into all of his political campaigns could also be used for good. But everything was done for a price. The expectation of loyalty, of publicity, of votes. Huey was very carefully tailoring his public image. There was a huge element of gamble to the way that Huey was planning to win public office. After all, going after the big corporations and the political machines alienated a lot of people in power who could be useful allies. But Huey didn't want to be subservient to anyone else, even if being subservient might mean that his rise was more secure. He calculated that he could pull this win off by railing against almost everyone in authority, appealing to the little people. He had his sights already always, on the next rung on the ladder. Soon enough, he would make his move. Thanks for listening to Autocracy Now. You can email us, autocracynowoutlook.com, follow us on Twitter at Autocracy Now, like our page on Facebook. Please leave a rating, review on iTunes, your favourite podcatcher, tell your friends. That way, I don't have to hand out embarrassing amateur-made t-shirts. Tell your enemies, too. Next time... Huey will make his move and run for governor of the state of Louisiana. Until then, be kind to each other. Our theme music is The Spirit of Russian Love by Zenadia Trokai, and you can find her stuff at costat.bandcamp.com. That's K-O-S-T-A.bandcamp.com. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. <laughs>